articulation switching is something that, from a user's point of view, is really simple and straightforward. They click a button or move a knob, or they send some MIDI data, a key switch or a controller, into the instrument, and it will change to a different articulation. From a developer's point of view, though, it can be quite complicated. We have to decide how we want to interpret that switch of an articulation. What does it mean to switch articulation? You can have your samples mapped to different groups. You could have different articulations at different velocity levels. You could be using groups with round robins or groups with crossfades. You could have your samples mapped in different samplers. There are all kinds of ways that we can determine how our articulations are separated. And therefore, there are all these different kinds of ways we have to decide how we are going to switch articulation. So in this video, I'm going to keep it relatively simple. We're just going to have one articulation per group, and we're going to look at the sort of other side of it, the user's side of it, which is how can we implement a UI for switching articulations. So our instrument today is going to be a trumpet. It's got a sustain articulation, a muted sustain, and a staccato. These samples are taken from the VSCO library. So we're going to have these buttons on the UI, so now it's selected on sustain. And then if we click on muted, it's a straight mute, I believe. And then the staccato. Okay, so here's the blank project that we're going to build. I say blank, I've laid out some of the structure here. We've got global modulation container, we're not actually using that, it's just something I always add by default. We've got a container with a sampler, and in our sampler we have a sample map, I've just called it Trumpet, and it's got three groups. And in fact, let's open this in the sampler workspace. So the first group is these uh, sustain samples, second group we have muted, and the third group is the staccato samples. So three groups, three articulations. And the folder structure for that is the demo project folder. If we go to samples, we've got each of those articulations just in a separate folder. And just the one sample map. So nothing exciting here. Uh, we've got the default envelope, which I've set the attack to two and the release time to 350. And we'll go back to our scripting view. So the first thing we're going to do is set the key colors of our keyboard. So we'll make a const, we'll call it key switches. And this is going to have three values, which are the key numbers that we're going to color for the key switches. So it's 24, let's do that inside the square brackets, 24, 25, and 26. There are different ways we could have done this, but since there's only three, it seems like a simple way. And then we're going to have a loop, which is going to go through all the possible keys. So that's 0 to 127. And we're going to say if key switches contains i, so if one of our key switch numbers comes up, then we'll call engine.setKeyColor. And for the key number, we'll put i. And for the color, we'll do colors.withAlpha colors.red, and we'll give it an alpha value of 0.2. So I'll hit F5, and we see our key colors appear there. Next, we want to color the playable range, so let's find out what that is. So we're going from the low key, 41, to the high key, 76. So this is kind of a crude way of doing it, but um, I think it's fine. So we'll say else if i is greater than or equal to 41 and i is less than or equal to 76 then we'll do the same thing so i'll just copy and paste that let's uh close that out of the way for a moment we'll change the color here to blue so the playable range should be blue there we go and we'll just put a comment here And we'll save that. So this is our UI script. And what we don't want is when stuff happens in the MIDI callbacks, 
uh, like on note on and on controller. We don't want that to affect audio playback. We don't want it to cause dropouts and we don't want it to be on the real time thread. So we're going to defer our interface script and you should pretty much always defer your interface script. It should just be a standard thing that you do. You might get some weird errors popping up that you've not seen before if you're not used to working in a deferred script. And that's good because that's telling you that you're doing things on the real time thread. So those things shouldn't be inside the interface script. So that's it. This entire script is now deferred. So if we were to go to the on note callback and put stuff in here, that would not be affecting audio playback and it wouldn't cause dropouts. Okay, let's go over and take a look at this UI now. Uh, so we've got the floating tile keyboard. I'm actually just going to drag that down here and change its name to FLT, just like that, FLT keyboard. So we've got three buttons and these are in a radio group. Come down here, I've set the, maybe that's smaller. I've set the radio group to one. So because these are in a radio group, it means only one can be active at a time which is perfect for what we want. But these buttons aren't hooked up to anything and we're going to do all the sort of hooking up through our scripting. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is we want to make it so when we press one of these keys on the keyboard, one of the key switches, it highlights the appropriate button. It activates that button. So in our on note callback, we'll create a variable called n that's going to be equal to message dot get note number. So I like to put it in a variable called n just so I don't have to write this out every single time I want to find out what the note number is. And then we'll say if key switches. So that's the key switches array we've declared here. So if key switches dot contains n. So if key switches dot contains n, so if the note number is in our key switches array, so one of the key switches triggered our callback, then we want to find out the index of the key switch in this array. So zero, one, or two. So index, and this will be equal to key switches dot index of n. And let's just print that to the console. So console.print index hit F5. So if we watch the console, when I hit the first key switch, it should say zero. Second one should be one. Third one should be two. So that works. So now we've got the index. Uh, we just need to get these buttons now into an array because we don't have any references to these buttons yet. So back to on init. And we'll put that down here. Call it uh, BTN group because that's the name I've given to these buttons. We've got BTN group zero, group one, and group two. And we'll make a const BTN group, and that's going to be equal to content dot get all components. And let's just give us a bit more room here. BTN group, and then we're going to put a bit of regex here, backslash, backslash D. So what this means is get every single component on the interface that has the name BTN group followed by a digit. So just like our buttons. And then we're going to assign a control callback to each of these. And we'll do that in a loop. Put 4x in BTN group. X dot set control callback on BTN group control. And let's just add some more lines here just to move that up. There we go. And now we'll declare that callback. And we'll come back to this callback in a couple of minutes. Okay, if we go to the script watch table, and I'll just drag this out a bit more. And here's our BTN group array. So this is showing the values of the buttons. So if I select the second button, you can see the second one becomes enabled. Third button, third one becomes enabled. So the references to our buttons are there correctly. Okay, if we go back to on note and we've got the index now, so now we can call btn group index dot set value one. So what we're doing is we're turning on the button that matches the index of the key switch. And because we've got three key switches and three buttons, they're always going to correlate. 
So there we go, that's working. And I'll just test that from my MIDI keyboard. There we go. Now even though we're making the button active here, we're turning it on, we're not calling the changed callback. We're not doing this, we're not going to go index.changed and trigger the button's callback. And the reason is we don't want to trigger the button's callback from this deferred script. Uh, all we want is a visual change. Remember, this is the interface script and everything related to the interface should be in the interface script. So anything that's not related to the interface shouldn't be part of that script. So at this stage, we have something that visually updates on the UI, but we're not actually changing the group that's active. So to do that, we're actually going to use a separate script because changing the active articulation isn't really the job of the interface. So we can put that in a separate script and we'll make that script non-deferred so it'll be real time and that way changing the articulation from a key switch for example that's going to happen instantly in real time and we don't have to worry about any issues with that. So we'll unlock the module tree and we'll insert this at the sampler level inside uh, the MIDI processors. We'll add a new script processor and we'll call this uh, group switcher. So there's our group switcher. I'll go to the on init for that. Okay, the first thing we need to do in here is get a reference to the sampler. And we could do that by uh, right clicking and selecting create generic sampler reference and pasting it in here. But that will only give us a, a reference to a sampler called sampler one. But you may want to use this in another project or you may have multiple samplers in a project and you want it to adapt to whichever sampler you have. You don't want to have to call your sampler sampler one. So the way we do that is first of all, we need to get the ID of this sampler. So we can write const sampler ID equals synth dot get ID list. And this function dot get ID list can give us the ID of all the containers in the project, all of the effects, um, all of the synths, or in our case, all of the samplers. So we'll put sampler. And this will return all of the samplers in the project. But because this script, the one we're actually writing in, Group Switcher, is within a sampler, it actually can only see this sampler anyway. So even if there was more samplers in the project, this function is only going to give us the ID uh, sampler one. And we'll have a look at that. Let's close the UI designer for a moment. So here's our um, sampler ID array. So uh, get ID list returns an array of all of the samplers, because we've put sampler here, all of the samplers in our project. But like I say, because we're inside a sampler here, it's only ever going to return this one. So if I add another sampler to our container and hit F5, it's still only returning the one sampler name. And that's because we're within this sampler. I'll just delete that second sampler. So because it's returning a single value with an index of zero, we can actually just put square bracket zero at the end here, hit F5, and now we get a string, which is just that one ID. So we're getting the ID of our sampler, which is sampler one. So because we now have that, we can now get our sampler into a variable and it will always be the correct sampler name as long as this script is within a sampler. Do synth.getSampler and for the name, we put sampler ID. The next thing we need to do is disable Heise's built-in round robin functionality for this sampler. So we'll say sampler, and I think it's, is it enabled? Yeah, enable round robin, and we set that to false. So we're just disabling the built-in round robin behavior. The next thing we need to do is to build up the UI a bit. Uh, where is that? And that's not it. Let's click on this. There we go. So we're just going to build out this UI. We just need to add a few controls. I'm going to close the module tree so we have a bit more room. So we're going to have one called can be group. So const can be group plus content dot, uh, sorry, dot add knob. And the knob name is just going to be group and it's going to be at zero, zero. And then we will write can be group dot set range. And we'll put this as one to 50. If you have more than 50 groups, then change that number. 
And uh, the group index always starts at 1. That's why I'm starting the range of this knob from 1. And there's our group knob there. So this is going to be used to select the active group. So let's add a control callback for this. Can we group dot set control callback on can be group control and then we'll write that function and then what we want to do is take the value of this knob inside our control callback and set the active group of our sampler so this only works in a situation where you have one group per articulation which is why I said at the beginning there are so many different ways to do it I'm going to do this simple one so we've got one group per articulation obviously if you had multiple groups per articulation for round robins or crossfades or whatever, then you'd have to handle this slightly differently. So we'll write sampler.setActiveGroup and then we can just put value in there. And I'll hit F5. Now, so far it's fine. If I change this knob value to something like 4, we're going to get an error. And it's saying 4 is not a valid group index. And that's because we only have three groups. So we'll put a little safety check in our script for that. So we'll say if value is less than or equal to sampler.get attribute sampler.rr group. I think that's the correct name of the constant. We'll soon find out. Yeah, so now we can set this wherever we want, but it's only going to have an effect if the knob value is less than or equal to the number of groups we actually have in the sampler. Okay, so this is the tool that is changing the articulation for us. So, so far, this stuff on the interface, oh, look at that, all of them have become active. That's weird. Uh, so th this stuff on the interface is just visual. This knob is actually changing the active, active group. So if I play something on the keyboard and we're set to group one, so that's the sustain articulation. We'll go to group two, now it should be muted. And then group three should be staccato. And if I go to any other group, it will still be on staccato because um, of that safety check we've got. And back to sustain. So this is what's doing all of the magic. So the next thing we need is to have the key switch handling also in this script, because this is our real-time script. This one isn't deferred. So the key switch handling will be done here as well. And we're going to have an array called key switches. Uh, let's put that down here. So this is similar to what we have in our main interface script, except we're going to make this adaptable. We're not going to just populate it here with some fixed values, because if you drop this into another project, it may have different values for the key switches. You may not want just three key switches and you may not want it to start on 24. So we're going to add a knob to the interface to decide um, which is the first key switch. So we'll call it can be first KS and we'll add that. And I'll put that at a position of 150 and zero. If you're laying out uh, controls in a secondary script like this, uh, then I find a grid size or a spacing of 150 on the horizontal and uh, 50 on the vertical works really nicely. So if I hit F5, it will appear here evenly spaced. And it's just, just quite useful. Uh, right, so this one, our first KS, we need to give this, uh, we need to set the range, can be first KS.set range. That's going to be zero to one, two, seven and one. So these are all the possible MIDI notes you could assign for the first key switch. We'll also assign a control callback here. And what we want to do is populate our key switches array with um, whatever the first key switch is. So let's say we set this to 24. We want to set it to 24 um, plus the number of groups. So it'd be 24, 25, 26 in our case. So the first thing we need to do is clear our key switches array. So we'll call key switches dot clear. So that will remove any old key switches. And then we need to loop for i equals zero. i is less than sampler dot get attribute sampler dot r group. So we're looping through the number of groups in the sampler. So zero to three. 
Oh, and of course we need to have I++. And then in our key switches array, we need to do key switches dot push the value of the knob. So the first key switch, 24, plus I. And we'll hit F5 on this. And if we open the script watch table, here's our key switches array. And we see it's populated 24, 25, 26. If I was to change this to 30, now it's 30, 31, 32. And of course, if we change the number of groups we had in our sampler, we'd get more values in here after clicking compile or moving the knob. Now, of course, this doesn't affect the UI, so you'd still have to change the visual of the key switches. Obviously, we've set this to 30, but this is still 24. So um, you could update the keys, uh, the key colors in this function as well, but I think it's nicer to affect the keyboard colors from the UI script since that is part of the UI. What, what you decide to do with this is up to you. You can um, adapt it to suit your needs, uh, but we'll have this match the visual. So first key switch is 24 and 24 is what we have up there. Okay, so the last part of this little script we need to do is we need to actually, um, essentially, it's the same as what we had on the interface script. We need to uh, change this uh, group knobs value based on the incoming MIDI node. So we're in the note callback, so we'll have n equals message dot get note number. If key switches dot contains n. So if a key switch trigger the callback, then we need to get the index of that key switch. And then we just need to set the group knob to that index and then call the change callback. So we're not calling the change callback in the interface script, but we are doing it in this script because this is the script that's actively changing the group. And then k and b group dot changed. And oh, there's one change we need to make here. Uh, index is going to be from zero because it's the index of an array, but our knob starts at one. So we just need to add one there. I'll hit F5 on that. Okay, so now if I press one of these key switches, it should change the group here. It's two, three. And the same if I press on my MIDI keyboard, it's now changing the active group. And let's just test that, we should hear it. So sustain, muted, staccato. Perfect. And this is all happening in the secondary script. The UI script is just for the visuals. Okay, so we only have one more little thing to do now. If we go back to our UI script, and we'll get a reference to our group switcher. So we'll create that reference. Uh, let's just put that here. So that's a reference to our group switcher script. And in the control callback for our buttons, and oh look, they've all become active again. I don't know why it does that with a radio group. That's strange. So we need to get the index of the button that triggered the callback. So local index equals btn group dot index of component. So that will tell us if it was button zero, one or two that triggered the callback. And let me show you what happens if we print this out. Console.print index. So if I press the muted one, you can see it's showing zero and one, even though the muted one has an index of one. And if I press staccato, we're getting one and two. The reason for that is this callback is being triggered twice. So when I click sustain, for example, it's turning off the staccato and triggering the callback, and it's turning on sustain and triggering the callback. So we don't want to respond to the button going off. We're only interested in the new button that's actually being clicked and the on value. So if we just put if value here, that will get rid of that problem. Okay, and then what we want to do here is we want to, we've got our group switcher here, we want to call group switcher dot set attribute group switcher dot group and then we'll pass in that index. And once again, we need to add one to the index. So I'll just do that, hit compile. Okay, so I'll open the group switcher. And now we can see if I 
select sustain, this changes to one. If I select muted, it changes to two. And if I select staccato, it changes to three. So these buttons are triggering this knob and this knob is changing the active group. And we can just hear that again. So these buttons by themselves are not affecting the groups at all. They are just controlling this knob. Now, when we go to our note callback on the interface, if I press a note, it changes this on the interface, but this script, our interface script is not affecting the groups at all. It has no effect on it when I change the note. But if you remember, this script is also picking up the note numbers. So this is changing those groups. So this is one of the things when you create these sort of split script things is you will have or you're likely to have some slight repetition because you need certain things that are visual to also be doing uh, functional tasks. But by separating it like this, you'll make your program much more efficient. And it's also easier to debug issues. It's easier to reuse code in other projects. So I always recommend you defer your main interface script and your secondary script you probably won't ever defer, but sometimes they can be deferred as well. It depends on what they're doing. Uh, but if it's doing anything with the on note stuff, then probably you don't want to defer it. Okay, so that's this project completed. We've got our interface script and uh, we've got our key switcher. So I'll be posting this project on Patreon for my higher tier supporters. So if you'd like to get that, go check out uh, my Patreon page. I'll leave a link in the video description. If you've got any questions or comments, please leave them below and uh, give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to see more, click subscribe and please share it with anybody you think might be interested. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.